Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our September Coffee and Conversations. Coffee and Conversations is a monthly discussion series jointly organized by the UNH Carsey School of Public Policy, the State of New Hampshire's Bureau of Education and Training, and the New Hampshire Association of Certified Public Managers. My name is Yusi Terrell. I work with the Carsey School's Center for Impact Finance. Kicking off this season is Kelly Nye Langerman, director of the UNH's Institute on Disability, commonly known as the IOD. Kelly will lead a conversation on increasing expectations, participation, inclusion, and belonging 33 years after the passage of the American Disabilities with Act, commonly known as the ADA. Kelly brings a wealth of experiences both within and beyond a university setting to help us double down on promising practices and system change and policy solutions. Preparing for, this conversa preparing for this conversation helped me realize that disability and accessibility and inclusion have played a larger and longer part of my life than I was aware of. My first job in high school was working for our town's engineering department to make our sidewalks more accessible. And just last year, I was a trainee in the IOD's fantastic LEND program, which Kelly will tell you all about. This realization may be true for many of us, that once we hold up a disability lens, we see both our communities and our own lives differently and see a fuller potential. So Kelly will take it away and um, feel free to drop questions, reflections, suggestions in the chat as we go. Kelly, I probably won't interrupt you, but if there's something particularly salient, salient I will. And at the end of your presentation, we can open it up for a rich discussion. Um, I'll say that Jen Saluski, uh, who is Associate Director of the IOD, is also joining us and will be able to answer questions and join in the discussion. All right, I'm gonna share my screen here so we can get started. And I'm gonna check with my colleagues here. And um, Bailey and Yusi, are you guys seeing the correct full title screen yes. there? Yes? Looks yes. good to me. All right, excellent. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Nye Linkerman, and I serve as the director of the Institute on Disability here at the University of New Hampshire. And I am so excited to be here with you this morning. I appreciate everyone taking time out of their day and starting this morning with a robust, hopefully, conversation with some new information, ideas, and thoughts about disability inclusion and participation. So I do have a, a brief-ish presentation for you today. I'm going to talk a bit about the Institute on Disability and where we sit within the university uh, community, as well as within New Hampshire's disability community, but then I'm going to dig in a little bit more and talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the goal is to reflect on sort of where we've been in the last 33 years related to the ADA and where we're sort of headed and what we might want to be thinking about in terms of policy, community building, um, and education on sort of the next 33 years in front of us. Get my, get my slide rhythm going here. So the first slide that I have here, um, since we are having a conversation today, is telling you a little bit about myself. So I'm Kelly. As I mentioned, I work at the Institute on Disability. You'll see IOD referenced um, throughout my slides today, and that's what that acronym means. My training and background is in social work, um, and I've spent the majority of my career working in disability policy and services. Probably the most formative experiences for myself working in the disability community is working as a direct support professional. Although I identify um, as a family member and have deep connections to disability history across the United States, um, really working as a direct support professional in day and residential services really has shaped sort of how I see the world and how I think about the work that we do with the IOD and what we can do as community members to really be facilitators and supporters of inclusion and belonging. Um, my personal motto that I share, I actually have it up on my wall back there, is because nice matters. And uh, that is sort of a reflection of also how I hope to go about my work and um, maintain a, a good positive space to have conversations about tough things. Uh, and last but not least, I put my VIA character strengths on the bottom there, perspective, leadership, and kindness. And the VIA character strengths is a strengths-based approach in looking at personality and character traits. So if anyone is interested, it is a free survey. You can take a look at VIA character strengths. 
similar to Myers-Briggs color analysis. Um, what's the other one? Strengths Finder is another one. So character strengths comes at it a little different way. I'm going to be using a few acronyms today. Uh, you see, you can raise your hand or hit a buzzer or do something if I use an acronym that I don't more articulately uh, explain. But as we go, you're going to see in here ADA. You're likely going to hear CMS, Centers for Medica Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'm going to talk a little bit in reference about DEIA. And the A might be new for some folks, but as you hear and look at and see terms related to DEI, we're often adding the A now, which includes diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. I mentioned the acronym of IOD. I'll also reference HCBS, which are home and community-based services. I also use mental health uh, quite a bit throughout my session today. So you'll see that reference as MH. And then you'll also hear me use the term IDD for intellectual and developmental disabilities. While the IOD's work is very broad based across all disability communities, our history and our original foundation and grounding is around services and supports for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So you'll see IDD or ID, sometimes DD in the field um, as well, but that's what that term means. So as I get started today and, and sort of create some grounding for the for a conversation. One of the things is first and foremost is, is that most times when we say the word disability, people have lots of different thoughts and ideas about what that actually means because disability actually means different things to different people. And disability also occurs on a very wide continuum. So I'm gonna read you a definition that I often use when we talk about defining disability as a condition of the body or mind that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities, such as interact with the world around them. And there are many types of disabilities that impact how people, people's vision or movement, thinking, remembering, learning, communicating, um, hearing, um, and, and impact our social relationships. And so while we often use disability as sort of a, a broad term, the term disability or people with disabilities represents a very wide continuum of services. And there are many disabilities that may be visible that we see as part of a person's body or a person's personhood, but there's actually a lot of disabilities that we can't see. And so that's a really important thing to remember. Some people choose to self-identify, some people to choose to disclose their disability, and lots of people don't. And so it's really important to make sure that we're checking our assumptions and being mindful of respectful language because the disability community is very, very large and everyone else, everyone is on kind of their own journey about how they may choose to self-identify or not. So a friendly reminder uh, that not every disability is visible. Another thing that I like to ground sort of conversations about the ADA and the IOD's work is that reminding folks to reflect on disability as part of diversity. So we often, again, hear that D-E-I-A term, but D in this case does not stand for disability, it stands for diversity. But when you look at this graphic here, and these are numbers for the Center for Disease Control and Pre Prevention, is that almost 25% of American adults experience disability in some shape or form. And that again is them identifying of experiencing a disability. Uh, and so what that really helps me reflect on and in the work that we do is that the disability community is very, very large and that disability is an incredibly natural part of the human experience. And so while lots of people have strong feelings and emotions about what and how we define disability, the reality is, is that disability touches most all of our lives. And in some cases every day, and you see you reflected on that at the very beginning of when you were thinking about disability, there's actually all of these spaces and places that it touches our lives, our families, our communities, our relationships on there. And then the last grounding slide that I have is also about this kind of continuum of experience. If you look at disability history sort of overall and, and sort of in our human history is that historically people with disabilities have been actively excluded from community life 
from schools, from work, from public spaces. And over the course of the last 150, 200 years, we've been making these movements of where do and where can people with disabilities belong in community and society. And the reality is, is that on this continuum, today, the word we most often use when we talk about work is inclusion. And this is a great diagram to kind of visually represent this continuum of exclusion, segregation, integration, and then inclusion. And so inclusion really is that space where people with and without disabilities are existing together and that we may or may not be wearing our disability labels outwardly, but that we are sharing space in community and society together. Now, the really interesting thing that we talk about a great deal in our work is that what is the next iteration of inclusion? If we've really gone on this continuum over the last, again, 100, 150 years, is that what's next after inclusion? And one of the things we talk about a lot in our work is belonging. Now, belonging is super tricky because you can't really regulate belonging. There's no public policy that says this is how you do belonging. Um, belonging is more about a feeling and an experience of an individual. And so a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about about the IOD is that we're trying to take that next level, pushing that edge of inclusion to say, we want to even go beyond inclusion to say we're not just sharing space but that people with disabilities feel a sense of belonging and belong in the communities that they're a part of. I wanted to make sure to check my notes that I, I shared that. So where that brings us at the moment here is, what is the Institute on Disability? I often ask people if I can see them, you know, how many people have heard of the IOD? Um, but in case you haven't, I'll give you a little brief uh, introduction to the work that we do. So we are a research training, education, and policy institute that is a part of the CHHS community. So we're in the College of Health and Human Services here at UNH. And our focus of all of the work that we do is around disability policy and services. And so we may be doing research, we may be doing training, we may be doing technical assistance. All of those things um, touch back to or draw back to disability policy and services. We do have a federal designation as a University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, or USED. So if you're familiar with our work, you've probably seen that USED acronym before. Well, that is our designation, I do reflect back to you again, is that the work that we do at the IOD encompasses all disability, from behavioral health, to aging into disability, to physical disability, to intellectual and developmental disability. So while we have that designation, the work that we do really covers a, excuse me, a broad continuum of disability work. But by design, we're really intended to be that bridge between the university community and the disability and broader community at large. And so it's how do we take the awesome and wonderful things that we do as part of our work at the university and ensure that they get to people with disabilities and their families and communities and providers and vice versa. How do we take what we know about our communities and people with disabilities and their needs and preferences and vision and make sure that we're also infusing it into the life in the community of our university. So it's an interesting and wonderful place to be because we really are this conduit of sort of back and forth between the university and the community at large. The graphic that I have up here is actually, again, hopefully a new piece of information for folks. When I referenced that the IOD is a federally designated University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, many people often don't know that under the Developmental Disabilities Act, there are actually three required partners in every single state. And so every state and territory in the United States has at least one USED. So they have one version of the IOD. Every state in the United States and US territory also has a developmental disability council that focuses on advocacy, engaging with stakeholders and helping navigate um, systems and barriers for people with developmental disabilities. And every state 
also has something called the PNA or a protection and advocacy organization. So in New Hampshire, it's Disability Rights New Hampshire. And their role under that DD Act umbrella is around monitoring and investigating, providing legal representation, and ensuring um, from a legal perspective, equal access to community benefits and services. So we are sort of the DD Act partners, the Institute on Disability, New Hampshire's DD Council and Disability Rights New Hampshire. And then up on the screen there, I do have uh, our mission statement that the IOD promotes full access, equal opportunities and participations for all persons by strengthening communities and advancing policy and systems change, promising practices, education and research. It's a wordy one, but a good one. So my next slide here is, is that one of the other questions that I often get is like, well, then what does the IOD do? If you're designed to serve as a bridge and you're connecting people in the community, like what does that actually look like in a university and a community setting? And so our core functions are four. And so everything that we do, again, focused on disability policy and services and falls in one of these four buckets. You heard UC mention at the beginning in her introduction that uh, she was a LEND trainee. So LEND stands for Leadership, Education, and Neurodevelopmental Disabilities. And that is a training program that we offer here um, at the University of New Hampshire, as do many other universities across the country, focused on uh, supporting children and families who were impacted by neurodevelopmental disabilities. And so it is designed to bring interdisciplinary professionals and community trainees together for a whole year to study policy and services, community impacts, leadership, um, and clinical experiences to support children and families. So that's just one of our many training programs. And then the next slide that I have here, I'm not gonna read all of these examples, Oftentimes when I talk to folks, either in, from the university, from my university colleagues or out and about in our community, is that they might know one of the projects or programs of the IOD. The IOD actually has 45 different projects and programs um, that we are, that are part of our institute. And so lots of folks have heard about um, the unh for u program might be very familiar to some folks. That's our inclusive higher education program as part of the university here. They might be familiar with our LEND program that UC referenced. They might be familiar with New Hampshire Leadership Series, which has been in existence for more than 30 years. That's a training program for advocates and family members uh, who experience disability. We have a numerous training programs around the campus community building futures together. We actually house the first um, PCORI study. PCORI is Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Um, so UNH's first PCORI study is actually here at the Institute on Disability, examining telemental health services for people who experience intellectual and developmental disabilities and mental health conditions. So this is just a minor sampling of some of the different pieces of work that we do at the IOD. Um, and as I mentioned, I don't do this work alone. This work is really made possible by the more than 100 employees that work at the Institute on Disability. Many of them are here and based in our New Hampshire and New England community, but the IOD has about a fourth of our uh, colleagues who work in different parts of the United States. And so I really, as I go into talking about the ADA a bit now, I really want to make sure that that message comes through loud and clear is that this work is, be done, is being done by an amazing group of interdisciplinary professionals who are writing articles, who are teaching, who are training, who are working with people with disabilities and their families, who are engaging with policymakers, who are spending time in the classroom and who are designing research and implementing, excuse me, implementing research that improves the quality of life and facilitates inclusion and belonging for people with disabilities. So here's a couple of interesting things by the numbers that um, often can resonate, particularly with some of our university colleagues of like, well, what are we doing and how are we spending our time? Here's an example of that. So I gave you my, my sort of walk, my walking advertisement for the Institute on Disability, but now I want to shift gears to more of the focus of the topic for today that I would like to facilitate some conversation around, and that is around the Americans with Disabilities Act. The anniversary for the ADA actually happens at the end of July, and this year it was the ADA's 
33rd birthday. However, every birthday and every year that the ADA comes around and we take a month to reflect on that, it's an incredible opportunity to really sort of look back and say, well, what progress have we made since 1990? Because that's when it was first signed into law. But where do we also have to go from here? Because as a piece of civil rights legislation, this work is really never actually done and we have to keep working at it. Um, and the ADA is so much more than just thinking about enforcement of saying, well, here's the list of things that we do. And if we do these things, you know, we've met the letter of the law, but have we actually met the spirit of the law? So in the simplest form, and this is straight off the ADA's website, it's a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, jobs, schools, transportation, public and private places. Um, and the purpose of the law is to make sure that people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else. Now, I don't think, I wonder if it's curious to people sometimes to think about, well, what on earth was happening before 1990? Well, prior to 1990, we didn't have these protections. And that meant that discrimination, exclusion, um, and sort of separation of people with disabilities was a much more regular part of our day-to-day -day lives and community and society. And that it's, it's kind of interesting to also reflect that it took us this long as a nation to actually codify a civil rights law that was specifically looking at and thinking about people with disabilities. So the photograph that you see on the screen here is actually uh, the first George Bush, uh, George H. W. Bush, who is signing the ADA at the Rose uh, at the Rose Garden, and he has a couple of other kind of famous people in the background there. Justin Dart is probably the person if you know disability. He's got the hat. He's I think he'd be on the right side of your screen. But the text on the screen here outlines the five different titles or sections of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So sometimes you'll say, is this a, a this is impacting Title II of the ADA or Title I of the ADA? When they reference that, they're talking about Title I is employment, Title II is state and local government, Title III is public accommodations, Title IV is telecommunications, and Title V is miscellaneous provisions, and we could do a whole lecture about what miscellaneous provisions include, but we're not going to do that today. Um, so when you think about the ADA, these are sort of the five different buckets that the, the rules and the policies are trying to impact um, and improve. So one thing, um, there's many things I'd like you to, I hope you take with you today as we do the conversation, but it's really, really important to reflect on this statement right here. And the ADA does not mean more than for people with disabilities. It means equal to people without disabilities. And that is a really, really important statement because sometimes you'll see in media, in the community, in friends and neighbors, people get the ADA wrong and they think about it's about giving things to people with disabilities. And it's not about giving things to people with disabilities. It's about creating equal to people without disabilities. So while it might seem like a bit of semantics, it really is at the core that, again, as a civil rights law, this is about equity and equality to access, not giving more than. So I'm sure people may have thoughts or feelings about that, but an important reflection that I always like to share. The other thing to think about is like, why do we still talk about it? There's lots of laws that we have on the books. Why does the ADA still matter today? It's like, haven't we done all the things that we said we were going to do in 1990? And the reality is we hadn't. We're actually still really far from it. Um, and so it's important to sort of reflect on what progress we've made, but also be able to keep the conversation moving forward to say that civil rights for people with disabilities in all groups are more important than ever. And that some of the gains that we've actually made over the course of the last 33 years, they risk being sort of rolled back for a variety of different reasons. And so we have to keep civil rights at the forefront of our minds, our conversations, our, our research, uh, et cetera. That 
the ADA matters today because ensuring access to support or ensuring access supports equality of opportunity. So again, going back to that statement, it's about, not about giving more than, it's about having equal to. The other thing that it really matters why we keep talking about the ADA is that people with disabilities are one of the largest minority groups in the United States today. I shared that number of one in four. And the reality is, is that if you think about one in four people identify, adults identify as having a disability, think of how many more people who are friends, family members, colleagues, again, disability impacts and touches all of our lives. We do need to keep talking about these things. And the other thing is, is our work really isn't done yet because while we have made significant gains, we actually aren't fully compliant as a country um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I'm sure many people can think of media stories or circumstances where you're like, hey, shouldn't, shouldn't that be more accessible or shouldn't that have a curb cut or a ramp or um, you know, a TTY number that people can use? So we're still not there yet. But one of the things that we at the IOD think is very important is that even when we sort of reflect on where we need to go and sort of critically think about, we need to keep pushing that edge of inclusion, um, the ADA has changed a lot. The photograph that you see here is a young girl named Jessica. This photo is pretty famous. It was taken in 1988 and Jessica and many of her friends uh, got out of their wheelchairs, set down their walking aids and devices and they pulled themselves up the stairs at the US Capitol. And this was approaching the passage of the ADA. But the point of this particular movement and this particular um, community event if, uh, was that the US Capitol building was not physically accessible. There were not ramps. There was not a way for people who use mobility aids or wheelchairs to actually safely and appropriately enter the US Capitol building. So this picture is very famous because if you look at the broader picture, there's hundreds of people climbing up the stairs at the US Capitol. So the ADA has done a lot of good things because it has increased access, inclusion, and opportunity to millions of people with uh, disabilities. And many of our students here at UNH today and many young people, they have grown up in an ADA generation where people with disabilities were included. But individuals such as myself, um, growing up and in work and in schools prior to the ADA, people with disabilities were not included in the same ways. In fact, a lot of times they weren't even really visible. Um, so the ADA has changed a lot in that way. It's also been an important tool about educating people around access and unique needs of people with disabilities. And it really has begin, begun to chip away at the environmental and social barriers that exist in our country in all sorts of different and insidious ways. So when we think about, let me click there, some of the great things is, is that the ADA has helped increase access for all. And so this is a great photo from the National Park Service, and they have a great part of their website that talks about the benefits of making accessible spaces in national parks. And so it's a great photo that I like to use because many times when things are universally designed or accessible for all people, it benefits everybody. So you probably heard the example of, while we now have curb cuts when we make new uh, construction or we have things like accessible trails, these things actually work really well for individuals who are pushing baby strollers or pulling wagons or who are using some other type of mobility aid or who are carrying, you know, 10 bags of groceries and don't want to, you know, aren't able to take an extra step or fall off. You don't want them to fall off the curb. So all of these kind of details that we're used to actually benefit a lot more people than just people with disabilities, or in this case, who use uh, wheelchairs or other types of mobility aids. The other thing the ADA has done is creating opportunity for workforce protection and workforce participation. So again, it's kind of wild to think about prior to 1990 that people with disabilities could be discriminated against in the workplace. And so the ADA has really helped us be more laser focused about what are workplace accommodations, what are the necessary workplace protections so people cannot be discriminated against or excluded in the workplace as a result of disability. And so there's a few uh, examples on the screen there about how we might think about workplace accommodations and how we might think about workplace protections. Um, there's something called the Job Accommodation Network or JAN 
Their website is askjan.org. And they're a, a whole website that looks at and talks about um, how to increase access in the workplace, but also helps people have conversations and get the correct information about reasonable accommodations um, for people with disabilities at work. And then one of the last things that I just want to reflect on what the ADA has helped us do is it's helped us increase our communication access. So now you'll see TTY offered. You'll see interpreters at public events. Again, it's not a perfect system because there are plenty of times that we're people with disabilities are not able to access certain things because of communication barriers. But the ADA has helped us as a nation and as a community make a lot of progress. Um, so that's something to really reflect on and celebrate as well, is that um, we now have tools and systems that are required to help make sure that communication can be part of everybody's experience in public services uh, and supports. So where do we go from here? Again, I mentioned these are some great things that we've been able to make a good deal of progress in the last 33 years, but we have to keep the conversation moving forward. It's a big part of what the IOD's work is all about, is that more access in real time. I think many people can probably very much reflect on a time where they were in a space or at an event or with someone where access wasn't possible. There wasn't the curb cut, there wasn't the elevator, there wasn't the interpreter, there wasn't the microphone. Um, there wasn't a way for people with disabilities to participate. We have to keep working at that. It's really also about addressing both the social and the cultural barriers that we experience that have kept people with disabilities from being fully included. And that means opening up all of the public spaces and community places through good universal design. For those of you who are working in the university or teaching community, universal design for learning is a really important principle that we need to be thinking about and designing our curriculum and our coursework. And then the other thing that we really want to ensure is making sure that we protect the gains that we've made, um, because many times civil rights don't always feel like that they're guaranteed. And so we have to keep those conversations moving forward by educating, sharing, and explaining not only the Americans with Disabilities Act, but why inclusion, participation, and belonging are so important. So in sort of this final stage here of the conversation is, where, where can and should we go when we think about increasing our expectations for ourselves, for our community, for our country to meaningfully include people with disabilities as well as be facilitators of belonging, we have to reflect on and look at voting rights and voting access. As a citizen of the United States, we all have the privilege, well, I shouldn't say we all, most of us have the privilege and opportunity to vote and making sure that we can vote, that we have access to voting, and that there are tools and support so we can exercise our right to vote. This is a, actually still a really significant issue. Um, so when folks are out and about, I actually think there's an election coming up in some communities here uh, next week is that are polling places accessible? Are the materials accessible? Are the election workers trained on how to either support a person with a disability who comes in to vote and ask for assistance? And what are sort of the, the rules around accessibility and access to voting stations, voting booths, voting tools? And so this is a really important part is that again, if we said 25%, of adults in the United States experience some form of disability, are we to the place where all of those individuals can access uh, voting the same as anyone else? And so there's a great deal of work and movement in this area of disability policy and services around promoting and ensuring voting rights and access. And that's a really important key for democracy as well. Another really important part, there is actually one of the titles within um, the Americans with Disabilities Act does talk about transportation, but this is sort of, again, pushing at the further edges is that transportation is such a significant issue in the disability community in the sense of that to do the things that we wanna do to be a part of our community, to exercise our voting rights, to use public services and supports, to participate in schools and community, we often need ways to get there. And access to good public transportation 
or just-in-time transportation is really a extremely significant barrier for many people within the disability community. So the screenshot that I have here, I actually took the image from someplace else, but I had an experience using Uber a couple weeks ago or a couple months ago in Philadelphia, where when I selected my Uber, I got multiple choices on what kind of support I might need, whether it was a different type of language, a different type of assistance, or a different type of vehicle if I had a mobility device or wheelchair. And this is what we want. Well, I, I'm going to be generic here. What, what the IOD and work like ours is also really trying to support and facilitate to say, how do we make sure that tools within our community are accessible to people with disabilities and that we're building infrastructure and capacity that makes transportation accessible for all people so they can participate and be of the community as anyone else is. Another really important area that we work on and, and talk about at the Institute on Disability and, and through many of our other counterparts around the country is that you may or may not know this, thousands of people in the United States who experience intellectual and developmental disabilities and other disabilities um, are not their own legal guardians. Um, and there is a movement to increase the legal the legal options and choices for people with disabilities to make their own decisions. And that model, one of the models is called supported decision-making. And that is actually a process where a person with a disability may get support to make important decisions in their life, but they do retain that legal authority of personhood. Um, so they don't necessarily have a legal guardian uh, or in some states it's called a conservator. And so Again, we sort of share and reflect that to say that oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, many people with significant support needs or intellectual and developmental disabilities aren't given choices about sort of their legal personhood after the age of 18. And so they do end up having conservators or guardians, depending on their state. And that's, again, something that we need to reflect on to say, are we empowering people to have choice control? Um, and autonomy over their personhood in the most accessible and inclusive ways possible. And supported decision-making is one of those tools that does make that more possible uh, for people with other or significant support needs. So that's something I wanted to share and reflect on of like, where are we going and where do we need to keep thinking about that edge of inclusion and belonging? And then last but not least is that you may know the direct support workforce by another name. They are the paraprofessionals that are working in long-term care facilities, working as paraeducators in our, in our public, private, and charter schools. They are job coaches who are supporting people with disabilities on the job. They are residential supports for people who are living in um, group homes, in residential facilities. So the direct support workforce outside of family caregivers is the backbone of long-term services and supports and home and community-based services in this country. And the workforce is in crisis. It's been in crisis for a very long time. There are not enough direct support workers. The wages and earnings for direct support workers are incredibly low. Many times they don't have access to the same benefits or career pathways or trajectories yet they do some of the most critical work that facilitates inclusion and belonging for people with disabilities. And so I share this as to say, the direct support workforce is not a formal part of the Americans with Disabilities Act, but if we are to live up to the vision of the Americans with Disabilities Act, we have a workforce that we need that supports people with disabilities in all sorts of different ways. And so the care, feeding, and support of the direct support workforce is really critical if we're going to meet the goals and expectations of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's really important. Um, and we could do whole sessions about the direct support workforce as well. So where does that leave you today as we end this conversation of like, so what are the things that you can do? Maybe depending on your job or where you sit um, in the community, these are things you're already thinking about. But sometimes I'd like to leave a few ideas in folks' heads and hearts about what can they do to be facilitators of inclusion and belonging. First and foremost, being aware of our unconscious bias that is a huge challenge for many of us in all sorts of different ways, including myself. 
is that being aware of the unconscious bias or the stereotypes that we carry, and sometimes they are ableist and people don't always realize it. So starting and reflecting on where your biases or where some of your blind spots are. Paying attention to language and terminology is so important because the words that we use matter, the words convey, the words we use to talk about our work or describe disability deeply impact how people think about and how we might fuel unconscious bias. So asking people the terminology that they want to use or listening to how people with disabilities share or talk about themselves on if people want to use, you know, identity first language or people first language. Um, So words matter. The other thing that's really important and it seems really easy is presuming competence. So for many people who experience disability, and I personally experienced this, and many of my colleagues and coworkers in my industry experiences that we often sometimes assume based on how somebody looks or acts or how they use words to communicate that they're not competent. And so we do all sorts of weird things um, for people with disabilities that aren't necessarily necessary. So always start from a place of competence to say that regardless of how a person looks or talks or moves about the world, that they are a competent, independent individual um, who deserves to be treated with dignity and respect the same way that you would treat anyone else. I also remind folks to never underact, never underestimate small acts of inclusion. One of the things that we were talking about with some of our student workers who support our UNH for You students here was that the things that they do as UNH students to support other students with disabilities on campus is that whether you're inviting someone to eat lunch or walk to class or join you for an activity, those small moments create an incredible amount of not only positivity, but individual and community change. And so don't ever underestimate those. We also need to be, as professionals, I think, especially in the university community, using and seeking out universal design strategies, whether that's how we treat or how we teach in a classroom, how we're running a community group, how we're supporting people or neighbors and colleagues about what is good design that helps us all participate. We always want to maximize representation whenever possible. And so while today I'm here representing the Institute on Disability, I also recognize the gravity of like, I'm talking about my own experiences personally and professionally and that of many of my colleagues in my network, but I don't speak for people with disabilities. And so having individuals who have lived experience be able to be the this, the voice and the face for the continued work and community action that needs to happen is really important. And then last but not least, ask questions that sometimes we are afraid to ask about disability. We're afraid of offending somebody. We're afraid of not saying the right thing. But if you ask many people in the disability community is that they would rather have people ask, well, what term should I use? Or or how would this, how might I be able to help? Different things, just ask. Um, Easier said than done, but that's always one of the things that I I ask people to reflect on. on taking individual action to be a champion for inclusion and belonging for people with disabilities. So for the next 33 years of the ADA, it is going to take all of us. It's gonna take all of us working together to call out and identify the insidious ways that discrimination impacts people with disabilities. It's gonna take all of us to be champions and use our voices to share, reflect, and give ideas on how do we improve and increase participation and belonging for people with disabilities. And it's really gonna take time. So sadly, when we have a new policy like the ADA, these things take years, years and years and years to fully implement and sort of fully realize the sort of dream of what does a fully inclusive world and community look and feel like for people with disabilities and for everybody else. And so it really is going to take all of us working together. So in closing, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. We're going to be able to share some questions and have a bit more conversation here. Um, But I hope that you've learned a few things about the IOD. And these are photographs of some of my many wonderful colleagues at the IOD. 
Um, so to remember us when you're thinking or have questions about things related to disability and policy, disability services, or are looking for different ways to think about representation and design. We have a great website. You can reach out and meet with us directly. You can follow us on social media. I shared a cover of our FY22 annual report. You can read more about us in that way. Um, many folks get an IOD calendar every year. You can stop by and get a 2024 calendar and you can tell other people about the work that we do or refer folks um, to the IOD for more information. So that's a picture of me. That is my email address. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Again, I want to thank folks for their time and attention. And I want to, again, really share both my, my joy and my privilege of being able to serve in my role as the director in representing the organization um, and being a, a part of the university community. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, UC, and turn it back to you on either some reflections and or questions. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was fantastic. I see that there are some questions and comments coming in in both the Q&A and the chat. I check both of those, so no wrong door here. Um, I Kelly, I can't see all of the affiliations from the audience, but I see some of them and it's really a great group. We have the Transitional Residential Enhanced Care Coordination Group, looking at transitions between residential treatment or inpatient psychiatric treatment back to the community, as you know. We have the Disability Rights Center, focused on law and advocacy, the Charitable Foundation, whose most recent strategic plan centers equity, um, someone from the religious community. And then more broadly at the state, we have the Bureau of Program Quality, um, the Department of Transportation, State Council on the Arts and the School Counselor Association. So lots of different angles that we could take here. And if other folks would like to drop their um, affiliations in, we can be sure to, um, to, to try to reflect those as well. Um, so folks, it's time to put in your questions and start this great conversation. I'm going to kick us off. And Kelly, I want to start about climate equity. Um, the Reflation Reduction Act allocates $27 billion to greenhouse gas reduction, and it's focused um, on climate equity. The Biden administration's Justice 40 initiative directs 40% of federal dollars in many um, of its categories, housing, transportation, and so on, to low-income communities and those who have been historically disinvested in. And we know there's a correlation between disability and, and income there, so I'm sure you can speak to that. But I recently read that persons with disabilities are two to four times more likely to die or be injured in climate emergencies, such as heat waves, hurricanes, and floods. And, you know, it also, the effects of climate affect the prevalence of disability in the first place, right? Because whether it's physical or intellectual, if you're looking at the, the functional model of disability, right? Um, in times where functioning is more difficult, um, it becomes the, the ability to perform these routine functional activities becomes harder. So I guess I have a specific and or general question. Um, the ADA, uh, you know, is, um, is, is, is regulations based on of usual functioning, normal functioning um, in emergencies, things like evacuation routes or communication might not have to hold to the same standards. But what we see of these hundred year events becoming more commonplace every 10 years, every two years, um, what does ADA implementation, how does that match the new realities of climate change? And then more generally, what does climate equity mean for the disability community? So you bring up a couple of great points. So one of the things I'll start with is this place of intersectionality of that, as we talked, as I shared, that disability is a really part of the natural human experience because so many people are impacted by disability. But the reality is, is that the intersection of race, gender identity, um, geographic location, income level, socioeconomic status, that there are these sort of multiple and layered effects. And so not only are people with disabilities at some unique disadvantages because of the way that communities are designed, including things related to transportation and emergency response, they are more likely to be negatively impacted or to experience death, injury, in other things of that nature. So while specifically I'm not aware of anything 
in the Inflation Reduction Act related to people with disabilities and climate change. What I can say is where we would see that intersection is, is that as there are more public investments at the local and the state level around emergency response, emergency preparedness, community design about like, how do we design evacuation routes? The ADA will bump up against that because anything that is in that public space that's using public funds does need to be designed in a way that is accessible to people with disabilities. And so one of the things that we have gotten better at in the last 33 years is that, again, when we're de designing a new emergency response system, is thinking about disability as part of that design component to say, okay, if people don't use words to communicate or they use a device or their phone is the only way that, you know, it will send a message to their hearing aids, there, those kinds of things are happening. I will say that there is a group both at Harvard and at Mathematica that is starting to dig in more into the impacts of climate change on people with disabilities specifically. And I can get you a couple of the names. Paul Shattuck is a name that comes to mind, and I forget the gentleman at Harvard who's working on it. Um, but the reality is, is that when we as professionals and community members are in those groups, either get, giving or providing input or designing things, we really need to be thinking about accessibility and access to people with disabilities um, as part of the sort of in the design and the implementation phase. So there isn't something like that I'm aware of. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but that I'm aware of specifically in the um, Inflation Reduction Act that intersects with people with disabilities and climate change. But if anybody knows of something, put it in the chat so you see and I will better educate ourselves. Well, let's start with a question from, from Jen Johnston. Um, where can an employer find resources for working with neurodivergent employees? For example, if struggling connect, connect with supervisor, is there a support for the supervisor on techniques on relationship building or trainings on what to expect? So just like I mentioned Ask Jan, which you see you put in there, um, there is also a website called Ask Earn, the Employee Assistance Resource Network. And that is run by the Department of Labor and the Office of Disability Employment. Um, and so that is the resource for employers that are looking to increase diversity, equity, inclusion in the workplace and where they can find other tools and resources at sort of a national level on employer and employee engagement. That said is, um, one of the other things is go, coming to a USED is a great place to stop and ask questions. There are also a number of groups. Um, respectability is one. Um, I'm losing the name of the other one. And, and Jen, if you can think of any, while you're here, if you can put them in the chat or chime in, um, in terms of being able to have uh, supportive consultation, Ask Jan is also another resource. So if employers also have questions about workplace accommodations, they can go and send a note to Ask Jan. The other resource that's often available, sometimes specifically about employment-related accommodations under the ADA, but there is actually a whole national network of something called ADA centers. I think the closest ADA center for New England is in New York. Um, and I can, if I have a moment, I can put the ADA centers up in there. There are another really great resource in terms of talking about what's the letter of the law under the ADA as it comes to accommodations and employee requests and sort of what's the spirit of the law. Right. Because you have some employers who are most concerned about compliance and others, perhaps mm -hmm. even more, that um, truly want to make their workplaces better. Mm -hmm. And in that spirit, um, you know, with, with both the left and the right hand there, I wonder about the workforce shortage currently. And if we're seeing an increased interest in general outreach or specific programming in New Hampshire, if you uh, specifically, if you know it, for people with disabilities. So I would say that there are very few states that have figured out what they're going to do and how they're going to do it, because for those that pay attention to the policy circle, there are some new um, requirements, expectations around staffing levels for long-term care facilities under the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid that have just been rolling out um, 
it's not new, but publicly they've been talking about it this week. This is a significant problem for our state and for our community. So the other challenge that we really are up against when we think about this is that people may be eligible for services. There may be a bed in a long-term care facility that you're hoping that your grandma can get into. There may be an after-school program that, that your child who experiences disability wants to be in. There might be something you've signed up and registered for, and there's no workforce to implement it, so therefore you go on a waiting list. Um, and and not, a, not a waiting list in the sense of that the service is not available, but it's not available because there's not a direct support workforce. So if you haven't been touched or impacted by it, I, I would venture a guess that it's going to happen. What we really can and need to be doing as, as a university community is how do we make um, our training tools and other resources available to do high quality workforce development so we can be training and helping build more pipelines to have careers and pathways in the direct support workforce. So a couple different ways that we're doing that at the Institute on Disability. So I'll just give you a few examples is we have something called Building Futures Together, which are paraprofessionals who are working in the substance use and recovery communities and the mental health communities to do some advanced training on family-centered care and family and community-based supports. They do a Department of Labor certified apprenticeship with a local employer who's serving people with uh, disabilities who are impacted by substance use and mental health. Um, and then they get a stipend and their employer gets some support on integrating their training program. And so we've got a pathway of paraprofessionals or direct, direct support workers, if you want to use that term, who are trained, who have had some advanced training, who have been working with their employers and who've had an apprenticeship in the field to get them embedded, trained up, and ready to serve and support. Um, and so that's one way that the university community can play a role in that. We're also getting ready to pilot something called the Direct Support Professional or DSP Academy for direct support workers who are supporting individuals with intellectual disabilities. Our LEND program is certainly training interdisciplinary professionals um, in how to best serve, support, and work together to serve people or uh, children and families impacted by neurodevelopmental disabilities. And so that's, again, offering training, offering a stipend, providing clinical and leadership experiences. So when they graduate and go out into the universe, they are not only feeling prepared, but supported on that particular journey. However, one of the biggest challenges is that we have as a, as a state and as providers is there is not necessarily more money to pay people because if you talk to DSPs, because there's been lots of research and studies and we study it here at the IOD about what DSPs want is it is better wages and salaries. It is a pathway to a career. It is access to benefits, um, whether it's healthcare benefits, retirement benefits, and it is really respect and dignity as a, as a profession. And that's something that historically direct support workers have not had because in many cases and in jobs, you can make more money working in the grocery store or at the coffee shop or at the mall than you can working as a direct support professional. These are really hard and difficult jobs. And so we really actually haven't found sort of the right mix um, Recently, well, I shouldn't say recently, I think it was 21 or 22 um, that I wish giving care is the name of the report from the charitable foundation, um, looking at the direct support workforce in New Hampshire. So I don't know if someone else can put in the chat the giving care report. That is a great set of recommendations and strategies that we can do at a high level, at a state level, but also things that we can do to think about how do we incentivize um, individuals to work and pursue jobs and careers in direct support work? How do we um, make sure that we are looking at different parts of the community in terms of places we can recruit, whether it's students, older adults, retirees? Um, so I, again, that giving care report, I'd really draw people's attention to, to take a look at, but it's really going to take all of us because it's about training and education. It's about recruitment and engagement. It's about wages and benefits. Um, and it's really about lifting up that direct support as a, 
career trajectory and a pathway. Um, and it's not easy because again, we're not always inclined, I'm just speaking generically to, to invest more money in that. But the reality is, is that is likely what it's going to take. That's Kelly's perspective. Um, <laughs> I know not everybody shares that perspective. So. We like Kelly's perspective. That's yes. why. Well, it's, it's just one of many. <laughs> <laughs> For the broader perspective, uh, Megan has requested generally, Megan Henley, um, if you could speak to some of the ways that IOD work um, complements other ongoing work at the university and the broader mm -hmm. College of Health and Human Services. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, Dennis has also asked uh, um, a bit about money and uh, it first offers a free attendance to the upcoming Human Services National Conference. So anyone interested in that? please feel to contact him directly. But he also asked, do you think that some citizens resent the tax money involved? There are small-minded people out there. And I, I guess, you know, referring to other federal um, legislation such the, as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, right? For providing free and appropriate public education to children with disabilities, special education related services, the federal government committed to paying 40% of the average per pupil expenditure, but has, ne the, has never met its pledge. So currently pays less than 13%. What is it like for the ADA? I would say that I, I and I don't have those specific numbers, but I think we I, I think the same is true. And I I think part of it is about it's a con, kind of a continuum of experiences is that, as I said at the beginning, not all people identify as a person with this a, a disability or recognize how they benefit from well universally designed public services, whether it's buses, schools, physical spaces. And so part of it is, is about this education component of like, how does the ADA actually lift all of us up? Um, the other thing that I would say is that there's always going to be a real, a very broad continuum of experiences about how people feel about where their taxpayer dollars go and where we as a country and nation and even as a state about where we want to be making public investments. Certainly where the IOD sits and the work that we do with our DD Act partners and our many other, you know, partners and friends around campuses is that really the investment in equity and access is something that actually makes good business sense. So case in point about when we think about employers that are having other types of workforce shortages, and I'll give a shout out to the New Hampshire Small Business Development Center over at Paul College, who is an awesome group of people who are working with New Hampshire um, small and medium-sized businesses on all sorts of issues that they're facing um, related to workforce and other things. But we've had lots of conversations with them about how do we help employers recognize, have you tapped into people with disabilities as a population that could be high quality workers for your business, could add value to the services that you're providing to your customers, and can sort of enrich or enhance the workforce overall. And so it's also, I think, helping people reframe that conversation and that kind of thinking of like, it isn't about giving to people with disabilities per se. The ADA is about equal to, to say, whatever you see has access to, Kelly has access to too. Whatever Jen gets access to, um, Bailey, who's on the line here too, Bailey gets access to. So I do think that there is this strong educational component to say public investment in people and community is actually good economic sense. And I know some of my lovely economist friends, um, both from Paul College and here at the IOD, could give whole lectures on how investing in equity and inequality in the workplace and in community actually makes good financial sense for taxpayers. Um, again, do we want to change hearts and minds about this? Absolutely. Oftentimes, we sometimes do it one person at a time or one project at a time. Um, and I think having a, a deeper conversation about how we as a country and as a state invest in people with disabilities and invest in our community more broadly is probably a whole nother coffee and conversations topic. It's a good idea. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard one. It's a hard one because everybody has different experiences. Um, and, and a lot of people have different opinions about it. And so it really, for us is going back to how do we meet the letter of the law? 
you know, and, and that is that is an expectation. So people with disabilities have the same access to everything else that people without disabilities. But then how do we meet the spirit of the law? Because that's sort of the other kind of invisible part of the ADA and many public policies to say, sure, I checked this box and did this thing, but has it actually changed our practice, our feeling in kind of the the space more broadly for people with disabilities or community? Right. You know, it does feel that themes of equity, of place-based, community-based framing is popping up, um, not universally across society, but in many different places, and in some ways in many different silos. Uh, so in the Department of Transportation, for example, has been investing in mobility management, which is fantastic, and a, a, a term that I hadn't heard of, I would think of it more as accessibility, but they're coming at it from a slightly different angle, doing great work in regions across the state. Um, New Hampshire has a um, drafts a 10-year state strategic plan every two years. Um, and so how uh, it, it it seems like it must be difficult for all of these um, different entities from different angles to connect, to translate, to collaborate in ways that, um, uh, you know, are efficient and effective. Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. And I think, again, you sort of reflect on this continuum. And it's a unique place for the Institute on Disability to sit because some of the work that we do is very direct and we are able to implement and, and act on immediate change to make things more engaging, accessible, visible, and inclusive of people with disabilities. There's also this part of like, there's this policy and political dance of like, what what can be tolerated? You know, when we keep pushing, I mentioned pushing the edge of inclusion, there are sometimes, and, and I'll, I'll own this as Kelly's opinion, I'd love us to kick down the doors and be like, you know what, let's not let it trickle in. Let's just let it all, you know, let's deal with all of this right now. But the reality is, is part of where we sit as, as an institute within the university space is we really are always having to balance that. And, and that's, it's not an easy place to sit because while all of my colleagues and employees and partners have their own kind of perspectives and experiences related to inclusion and disability, part of being able to move the policy needle means that we have to go kind of slow. We don't really like to, and that's never ideal, but it does take oftentimes incremental change in movement. So getting, the, again, the mobility management group together and talking about these things and making plans and then there are other things that just need to happen immediately that many of our partners, my partners and colleagues at the Disability Rights Center New Hampshire navigate every single day. So it's sort of a both and, and you really need a deep bucket of all kinds of strategies. Because for us, we have to be ready to meet people where they're at and say, okay, you might not be all the way there yet in thinking about these kinds of hiring practices in your business, but we're gonna help you start thinking about it. And there might be another employer that's like, I want it all, give it to me now. How am I gonna talk to you know, my employee base about new hires that we're gonna have coming in? And so it's really being able to be prepared of sort of who is your audience and, and, and how and where do we help people as individuals move forward, communities move forward and help like a system move forward. And that's, again, the fun, exciting, amazing thing about working at the IOD is we're working at all of those different levels. So again, some of my colleagues here are in, in the room, I think could definitely speak to that because when we're thinking about implementing the ADA, both by the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, there are individual actions, there are sort of local and community actions, and there are system-wide actions. Jen, you turned your camera on, which tells yeah. me something to add. <laughs> so I did, yeah, I just thought I'd jump in. I know we just have a few minutes, but um, as we're talking about all these different things, I think um, what's, what's coming to mind is going back to what you were saying about language, Kelly, and people in the disability community have been talking about like the idea of special needs and that people with disabilities don't have special needs, they have the same human needs as anyone else. And so some of the things that people at the IOD are working on are things like access to transportation, housing, food security, um, the right to participate in community recreational activities. All of these things, are, if there's a 
same thing that we all need in our lives um, and just making sure that people with disabilities don't have barriers to accessing those things. Um, and one of the things I'm really interested in is how do we explore that intersection with people that are not in the disability world, but studying the same issues? How do we address the housing issues for everybody, including people with disabilities and food security and recreation and all of those things? So it's sort of not that not the other. It's like, how do we put good design that is baked in? And one of the I think the ADA actually helps us sort of align our thinking and our practices. So it's like when we're designing new housing or when we're designing a new program, how do we make sure that we're thinking about inclusion and access for all people, regardless of disability or not disability or how old you are, where you live. Um, so thank you, Jen. That you, I feel like you did a much better, a better like touch point of like, this is where the eight, this is some of the very salient examples of how we at the IOD are, are working with partners in community to address those things. Kelly, Jen, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. I want to be respectful of folks' time. I think we could continue this conversation for another half day. Um, uh, I imagine people can reach out to you if they have questions. Um, thank you for answering um, the question about long COVID. And, uh, you know, let's hope that the next 33 years is as, as fruitful and transformative um, now that it is, uh, you know, there's the law and um, the requirements. And as our spirit um, continues to show us new ways forward, that those get encoded as well. Um, next month's Coffee and Conversations will be with Will Stewart of Stay Work Play, New Hampshire. So I hope everyone can join us. And Kelly, thank you again.